sermon begins in chapter 3, in verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord. Father, will you speak to our hearts this morning? Father, as we see in the life of Nicodemus, Lord, knowledge is not salvation. So I pray, Father, that you would impart your knowledge to us, Lord, but that we would receive it and apply it into our lives for your glory and for your honor and for your namesake. I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May be seated. Well, what we know is in chapter 2, last week when we talked about the cleansing of the temple, Jesus, <laughs> he, he came in and he, uh, <laughs> I, I love that passage because it shows a real passionate side of Christ that you, know, you don't see in the movies. You see a real humble and meek and you see, especially the old movies, they made Jesus look wimpy. They really did. They, looked like he, they made him look like a wimp. And for that, a lot of people don't, hey, I don't want to be a Christian because Christians are wimpy. But Jesus was far from wimpy. If you take a look into the Gospels, you see a totally different Jesus. It took fortitude to say and do the things he did. One of them clearing the temple out. He, the Bible says he took cordage and he made, he made a whip. And, yeah, chased all the cattle out. We talked about that. And he shooed them all out. And I can assure you he didn't have a large crowd of people behind him hooting and hollering and saying, go, Jesus, go. Those who were saying, go, Jesus, go, were literally saying, go, Jesus, go, out the back door, you're going to cause a ruckus in here. Okay, it was not popular what he did. He didn't receive a standing ovation. They were not happy with him. We talked about why he did that. He said, it is written that my father's, that my father's house is to be a house of prayer. He says, and you have turned it into a den of robbers. And so we talked about the whole money changing and everything else. And the, the, the context in which it happened, people say, well, we shouldn't have bake sales in church. You're missing the whole point. The point is that they were exploiting people. They were taking advantage of people. Brother Frank and I was talking after service last week, and he said, hey, you know, and we had this conversation. I said, yeah, I know that. For the sake of time, I can't really give you everything. But what we discussed was something I didn't share, was that Frank shows up with his, his lamb to sacrifice, and I tell Frank, hey, uh, this thing is, is blind. Can't use it. So I take his lamb and I put it in the prayer room. I said, but I got one to sell you, Anthony. Bring, bring, the, bring, the, bring the lamb out. Anthony brings another lamb out. We sell it to Frank and we gouge him for the price. So Frank's happy and he goes on. Well, five people later, when Brother Rob shows up, I sell him Frank's lamb. The one that was supposedly blind or lame or couldn't be used, I sell it to Rob. Rob don't know. They were, it was all kind of diabolical, underhanded stuff that was going on. And the, the, the court of the Gentiles was crowded with stuff and people and they were not even allowed to worship. And they came to the temple. Coming to the temple was supposed to be a time where you worship. And they were coming for everything but that. Amen? Amen. So I asked a question. And Jesus said the same thing. Basically, he says, why are you here? If we are not here to worship God Almighty, then we are here for wrong reasons. Amen? So I asked you to examine yourself. Why do you come here? Because the pastor's going to get on your case. If I don't have a drummer, hey, where's my drummer at? You know, is that why Luke shows up? God, I hope not. You know, why does Christy and Nick show up? So they can showcase their talent? God, I hope not. Why does pastor stand in the pulpit? Because I like to sound cool and snazzy and I like, I like the attention. I, God, I hope not. Why do you show up to church to keep me off your back? Because somebody expects you there? I mean, this, those are pathetic reasons to show up. I would hope that you're coming out of a love and an overflow of your heart to worship the living God and corporately coming together as the Bible calls us to do. Right. Amen? Amen? That is the only reason. If that's not your reason for being here, then you really need to, well, like <laughs> Flip Wilson said, get a checkup from the neck up to get rid of your stinking thinking. Because that's the only reason why we're to be here, is to worship the living God. Amen? Amen. Now, <laughs> as we look into this, this is another one. I know I say this every week, but this is another one of my favorite passages. Over by Frank's house, Frank lives in Hammond on 169th Street over there by Kennedy Avenue. There used to be a sign in somebody's front yard that said, ye must be born again, John 3.3. 3. Remember that? Yeah. It was up there for a long time. I think the dude moved, and that's the only reason why it's down. He changed his fence. Did he? Because it was all day, every day. Ye must be born again, King James. Ye must be born again, John 3.3. 3. 
Let's take a look. The scripture reads, oh, so I ended last week where Jesus, after he cleared out the temple, all these people started following him because they could, they seen what he could do. They seen what he can do. Candida, would you come up here, please? Where's my wireless mic? Somebody swiped it. Oh, gone it. Wireless microphone. That's okay. Yeah, could you get it? Come here. The scripture reads, because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. Because of the miraculous signs that he did, many began to trust in him. And so they're following Jesus. Whoa, Jesus, you're super cool. You're the man because you can do these things. We want to be a part of that. And the Bible says Jesus is no fool. Jesus knows the fickle human heart and how we can be on his team one day because it's convenient to do so. And we'll bail out and jump ship the next day because it's inconvenient to do so. Because of the miraculous signs that they've seen. Candida shared a story with me this morning. I want her to share it with you. Now, I was going to do it at the end, but it seems appropriate right after this here verse I just read. Would you share? Yeah. So I was telling Pastor that Thursday I had went to... Um, have a follow-up on my um, mammogram and it just so happened that they took the pictures and then I had to have an ultrasound with it so they sent me to the ultrasound and the, t the lady that was doing it was searching and searching and I'm smiling she's like what are you smiling about I said you can't find it can you she's like no <laughs> she said no she said, your tumor is not there, but I need the radiologist to see it. And I said, okay. And it so happened to be the same one who diagnosed me with my cancer. And he came in and he said, not only is it not there, he's like, there is no sign that was ever a tumor there. <clears throat> he said, so as far as I'm concerned, he said, you are cancer free. He said, and um, he's like, I'm just speechless. He just kept shaking his head. He said, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I said, I do. I've been praying and my church has been praying and friends and strangers and people I don't know. And I just want to thank you guys because I wouldn't have made it without all of you praying for me. <clears throat> I'm not done. I still have to have radiation, but I am done with cancer. Amen. Amen. Now, many of you know that's my sister. You're like, hey, he's kissing that lady. She ain't his, <laughs> my sister. And uh, she looks a whole lot like me these days with her short hairdo. Uh, well, my sister Emelise was diagnosed with MS years ago. And she shared a similar testimony as God has healed her body. Gone. Amen? Amen. 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 And people say, hey, I want to be in the Burgos family because God is blessing I want to be a Christian because God takes cancer away. God heals MS. Listen, I'm here to tell you that is not why we serve God. Amen. These are the blessings and the byproduct that overflow from a loving God. But you know what? This health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that, hey, if you follow Jesus Christ, your life is going to be fine. Word for that, and it's called hogwash. Okay, we are going to experience trials in our life. That's just the way it is. And so when you see Jesus do something miraculous in the life of a person, that is not why you follow him. Right. Amen? Amen? I want some of that. Brother, I'm here to tell you, you may come to a life of Jesus Christ and have nothing but trials and problems and illnesses and challenges. And you're like, well, where's my God? And then now because it ain't working out, you just quit. Forget it, Jesus. You're not faithful. I got news flash for you. He's always faithful. Yes, he is. Okay, but this is what I'm talking about. The Bible says, because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover, many began to trust him. You said that's a great thing. And it is, if it's a genuine trust, a biblical trust. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew their human nature. No one needed to tell him how mankind really was. Amen? Right. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, there's a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that is a lie. That if you come to Jesus Christ, you're a son of the king, and he wants you to have all these riches. The Bible says that the God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Right. Amen? Right. Not yours. Now, don't get me wrong. There's, there's people here in this church who have health complications. 
and they're praying and asking God to move, and God seems like he's not moving. Well, there's a reason for that, and we don't know and understand that, but that's not a reason to stop trusting God and stop following God because you don't get what you want. He is not an ATM machine. Amen? Amen? That's the world we live in. Hey, put the microwave popcorn in the microwave and push the button, and you get popcorn. Voila! You remember? I'm dating myself now. You remember the old days? <laughs> you kids don't know nothing about that. You kids don't know nothing about that. We don't have a pot. A pot. Like you cook hot dogs in. And you got a lid on it. And you got corn inside. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting some, amen. We're getting a witness over here. And you got and you're shaking it. Because if you didn't, it burns. And you hear pop, 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 pop. And when it stopped popping, you hurry up and get it off. And you burned the popcorn. There was an art to it. If you wasn't good, you burned it. Start again. With a new pan, because that when all the popcorn now tastes burnt. You kids are like, what? Microwave error. You don't know nothing about that. You know? It's so that's the world we live in. Instant. It ain't quick enough. Faster. The Keurig. Not fast enough. <laughs> Somebody shut it off. It takes 60 seconds to warm up now. Seriously? <laughs> no one needed to tell Jesus anything. He knew how fickle mankind was. Okay? We want everything. We want it now. That's not how Jesus works. God's time is not your time. So chapter 3, verse 1 begins with this. There was a man named Nicodemus. He was a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were part of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin Council. They were actually, uh, they were a group, they were a sect of very smart and intelligent, very educated people. Okay, they were the muckety-mucks, the big cogs in the synagogue. Okay, so these guys were kind of important in the synagogos, right? <laughs> in the synagogue, the synagogo. There was a man named Nicodemus. He was a Jewish leader who was a Pharisee. And after dark, <laughs> this is good stuff. I got a vivid imagination. I thank God for it. I picture Nicodemus creeping around in the dark, peeking around shadows, see who's watching. Incognito. Why didn't he come out in the daytime? The Bible specifically says he's lurking around in the shadows at night. <laughs> There's a reason for that. He has status. Being a follower of Jesus Christ might crimp your style. Life application, folks. I can't take my Bible to work because my boss, man, forget your boss. He's going to fire me. Was well, God going to provide you a new job or is it God going to protect you? Is God sovereign or isn't he? A Jewish leader, after dark, sneaks up to Jesus. He goes, Psst. Rabbi. <laughs> Jesus, I'm picturing this. I should put on a plane. Jesus comes up and goes, he says, that's the Lake County, what's up, right? Jesus comes up, what's up? And he says, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence, evidence that God is with you. The miraculous signs that we see in healing, God continues to move today to authenticate what he's doing, to show that he is real, to prove himself to the unbeliever, not to the believer. God has nothing to prove to you. He's already proven himself to you if he saved your soul. But he's trying, we're trying to win the lost. Okay? So he says, we know that God is with you. We see the evidence, the signs, and the wonders that you do. Somebody have a different translation. I'm reading NLT. I'm reading, and it says, uh, verse 2, it's, um, the latter part of verse 2, he says, we all know that God has sent you. Somebody read that. That's just beautiful because if you look, if you look in the Old Testament and uh, Exodus, Moses was when the plagues came. The Bible says that uh, the Pharaoh's magic men were able to reproduce some of those miracles, some of those plagues. They were able to do it. Amen. Right. All right. I'm not on an island. Right? I'm not making stuff up. Amen. Right. Okay. I thought I had two people who agreed with me. So if that is true, if they, you heard of counterfeit. Counterfeit miracles, counterfeit gospel. You hear this stuff all the time. So if that is true, and it is, because the Old Testament records it, couldn't Nicodemus easily, easily have been deceived here? Where he says, I know that God has sent you to teach us because your miraculous signs and evidence prove it. Couldn't Satan reproduce the same signs and, and wonders? He sure could have. Absolutely could have. But Nicodemus could have been blinded, could have been, could have been led away by that. Why wasn't he? Because he was enlightened 
by the Spirit of God. That's why. The Bible says you can't come to the Lord unless the Spirit of God draws you. Amen? So Nicodemus knew that these weren't counterfeit miracles. In fact, I got another passage here. I'm going to read it really quickly in the interest of time. It is in John chapter 7, verse 32. The Pharisees heard a crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent the temple guards to arrest him, him being Jesus. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and when I, where I go, you, I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me where I am. You cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man think he's going that we can't follow him? Is he going to go live among the, uh, our relatives, our people that are scattered among the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me and you will not find me? On the last greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. Whoever believes in me and the scriptures has said that the streams of living water will flow from within him. So Jesus is preaching. He says, by this he meant the spirit. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. And others said, he is the Christ, enlightened by the things that he's saying. Still others asked, how can, this, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Seriously? This guy's from East Chicago, man. What comes out of East Chicago? Harvey, remember that one? This guy's from Galilee. Does not the scriptures, not only that, it was not foretold that a prophet would come from Galilee. So he says, Did, does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family, from Bethlehem? Well, surprise, that's where he was from. Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. And finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees and asked them, why didn't you, why didn't you bring him to us? Why didn't you grab this guy? Why didn't you bring him in? And their response is, because nobody's ever spoke like this man does before. He speaks with power and authority, the guards declared. And then this is the response. You mean he's deceived you too? Seriously? You guys falling into a soothsaying trap? Come on, guys. It's supposed to be the guards. Has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him, they ask? Anybody else? Any of the teachers of the law believe in him? <laughs> and who's standing in the crowd? Nicodemus. Now, if you back up to chapter 3, in the book of John chapter 3, Nicodemus was creeping in the shadows. But in chapter 7, he says, uh, uh, hey guys, in his sphere of influence, he says, does our law allow us to condemn somebody without hearing them out first? Yeah, they probably like, hey man, be quiet, nobody's talking to you. They didn't want to hear that. <laughs> but at least he had the fortitude to speak up. He didn't in chapter 3, sneaking around because he's worried about what people might think. But in chapter 7, he's a little bold and courageous and opens his mouth. Amen? So what do we see here? Nicodemus was not blinded by the miracles. He was actually enlightened. But it can work both ways. You can dismiss it. You see what you want to see when you want to see it. It's a proven fact. There's this video on YouTube. Check it out. <clears throat> it's about, it's a basket. I don't know what it's called. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but there's a gorilla. There's these people passing a basketball. There's, there's, a, there's a team in black shirts and there's a team in white shirts, and they're passing the ball back and forth. They said, count how many times the ball is passed. Oh, yeah. One ball, yeah. two teams. And they're passing, and everybody's walking, and they're intertwining between each other. And you watch, and you're counting one, two, three, four, five. And it's over. You're like, 15. They passed the ball 15 times. They said, the correct answer was 16. I'm like, I was close. I was close. They said, but did you see the gorilla? And I'm like, what gorilla? And, and you think, there ain't no gorilla, so you, then they rewind it. And you watch the video again, and they're passing the ball. And while you're busy counting, a guy in a, in a monkey suit walks, literally a monkey suit, walks into the center of the group, and he goes, and he walks out. And he walks super duper slow, and he's clearly there. And you don't see him because you're too busy counting the ball, the passes. It's a proven fact. We see what we want to see. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to die. They didn't, want, they didn't, they didn't hear it. They didn't believe it. So Jesus tells, uh, he says, Nicodemus says, hey, we know that you're a guy, a man sent by God because your evidence proves it. And Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. I actually looked it up. Born again literally means to be born. And uh, Nicodemus' response is interesting. I'm reading out of the King James does somebody have a different translation? Read that verse I just read. Born again. To procreate of the father by extension of the mother, figuratively 
to regenerate. Okay? To bear, to be God. Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see. Circle the word see. Or underline it, highlight it. Use a crayon, whatever it takes. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. The Bible says that you cannot come to God unless the Spirit draws, onto, draws you onto himself. There are things you just cannot see, you just cannot understand because the Holy Spirit of God cannot possibly enlighten you because you are not a child of God. Right. And until you are born again and you receive this Holy Spirit, then like the Apostle Paul, the blinders fall from your eyes and allow you the ability to see. So I looked up the word see. It says, check this out. It says, used only in certain past tenses. The others being borrowed from the equivalent properly, properly to see, literally or figuratively, by implication in the perfect only. To see, know, and understand God's perfect will for your life, you have to be born again. I was a Catholic. I did not understand that whole born again thing. I know, born again Christians, they're weird. I'm knocking on my door, the God squad we used to call them. Lock the doors, close the blinds, nobody's home. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. <laughs> Nicodemus, what you mean? How can a man possibly climb back up inside his mother's womb and be born again? That's a great question. <clears throat> but it's interesting in the original language as you examine that, he says, Jesus says to be born again, to regenerate. And Nicodemus' response he said, how can a man enter into his, into his mother's womb and be born again? The, the, actual, the actual word that's used for being born is actually different. It's actually the physical part of being born, and it's totally different. And so Jesus tells him something really profound. He says, Nicodemus said, how can a man go back inside his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. There's different philosophies here. People say, oh, well, the, the water is the baptism. And, and, and the water symbolizes the physical birth. The water symbolizes, you know, the human birth, and then the spirit symbolizes the spiritual birth. I agree with that. The water baptism uh, is not regeneration. The water baptism is symbolic. People say, well, it's the God washing the person of their sins. I understand that. But being born, I'm reading out of the NLT. Listen to this next verse, verse 6. I want somebody to read it in a different translation. But here's what, here's what the NLT says. Humans can reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to the spiritual life. That's, that's the NLT. Somebody got a different translation? Verse 6. NIV says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to, fear, to spirit. Let me ask you this. <laughs> if you mate a cat and a dog, do you get a cog? Or do you get a dat? What dat? What dat? You don't get either. Amen? Right. Human beings cannot procreate with another species. Amen? Right. And we cannot give birth to the spiritual things. The spiritual birth is the thing, it's, it's the movement, it's the thing of God. It is an act of God. It's always been by God, for God, and it's always been through God. God births your spirit. You can't wake up one day and say, hey, I just want to be a Christian. It doesn't work that way. The spirit of God tugs at your heartstrings and draws you onto himself. And you will respond to that or you won't. But to think that you have any control over that. Did you have any control of your spirit, of your, your fleshly birth? I was born October 15th, 1971. I wanted to be born on Halloween. <laughs> I could have just stayed in there and put my arms out and hook my foot up and brace myself and waited 16 more days, right? No. Surely I could have. You can't. You have no control over your physical birth, and you certainly don't have any control over your spiritual birth. I remember a time, I shared this before, where uh, a man, he came, I was talking about seeing the kingdom of God. He came to me, and he, you know, he was, I was working the streets, and he looked at me, he goes, do you know Jesus? And he goes to shake my hand. And I was lost at the time. He goes, you know Jesus? I said, yeah, I know Jesus. I'm thinking of, you know, Jesus Hernandez from my middle school days. I said, yeah, I know Jesus. And he looks at me, he goes, you don't know Jesus? And I, I was like, whatever, dude. I didn't think nothing of it. I was lost. 
It wasn't until I was spiritually born later that I drew on that encounter, and he was absolutely right. Now, fast forward. About a year ago, I'm on the streets in Hammond. I go to a house where a guy is demonically possessed. The guy speaking in a foreign language. I know another officer that's encountered the guy numerous times and said, he don't talk like that. I don't know where that accent came from. And the guy knew everything that was going on. He knew Frank was sitting over here in this color shirt. He knew Tina was sitting over there and she had her hand on her chin. He knew that Anthony was over here and he had his hand on the back of his head. And he was saying what everybody was doing, people on the other side of walls. And I'm watching and observing this and knowing that this guy, there's something spiritual going on. And he's saying, you don't understand what I'm saying. Everybody's, you know, they're like, hey, come on, buddy. Yeah, we understand. Just sit on the, the, sit on the gurney. We're going to take you to the hospital. They're just trying to tell what he, what he wants to hear so they can get him going. And he says, you don't know. You don't understand. You don't know. You don't understand. I speak the truth. What I speak is something beyond me. And he's going on. He's speaking spiritual things. And I'm, I'm discerning these things. And I'm frightened, <laughs> to say the least. But I'm looking at him trying to be like, hmm, I ain't scared. So I'm trying to hold on my, uh, you know, I'm the police. So I'm not scared. Shoot, we handle business. That's what we do. So I'm like, but inside, I'm like, man, badge and gun don't mean nothing to the spiritual. <laughs> so I'm standing here. So I'm standing on the word of God now, and this, this, the authority of God's word, and on the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. I'm looking at this guy, and he goes, you don't know, you don't know. And I'm on the other side of this wall like this. He don't even see me. And I'm watching what's going on in here. And then I step over. Uh, of course, I didn't step out of Johnny Law. <laughs> but I stepped out, you know, and as I stepped out, he goes, you don't know. He goes, and you don't understand. And you don't, I'm speaking truth. And he goes, and you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I looked at him and I went, oh, man, freaked me out. He goes, and I was the only one. He goes, you know. And he turned his back to me. He didn't want to talk to me no more. He started talking to everybody else. And then after a while, long story short, the way I got him in the gurney was I used the word of God. I began to quote scriptures, and he's telling me, oh, you got to listen to you, and I quoted scripture to him and got him to sit down on that thing, and he was able to take him away. But the point is that the power of God, the Spirit of God, you cannot see the things of God until the Holy Spirit, until you're born again, and the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do and to see. Amen. And I'll be honest with you, I don't walk around like super saint all day long. That, that, that was a moment of weakness for me. I was afraid, but the Lord gave me the, the strength to persevere. So Jesus says, human beings give birth to human life, but it's the Holy Spirit who gives birth to the spiritual. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. This is, a fav this is one of my favorite analogies. Brother Frank shared it with me when I was being discipled. It says, the wind blows whenever, whenever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. NLT. Ooh, nice. If you, that would have been hilarious. <laughs> Brother Frank, when I was being discipled, he says, hey, can you, can you feel the wind? I said, yeah. He says, you can. I said, yeah, I can. It's windy today. I can fly a kite. He says, can you feel the wind? And I said, yeah. And he says, no, you can't. I said, yes, you can. Said, Look, the leaves are blowing. Look at the trees. He goes, but can you feel the wind? And I said, yes. He says, no, you can't. I said, what do you mean? He said, where does it come from? I said, well, it comes from uh, over there somewhere. It's the north wind. It's coming from the north. He said, but where is it coming from? Do you remember this? I said, from the north. Come on, dude. You're supposed to be teaching me. He goes, where does the wind come from? I can feel that because it's coming from the fan. Duh. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the wind. Wind. You ever thought about that? We feel the wind. The uh, wind's coming in from the northwest at 20 miles an hour. You can feel the effects of the wind, but you really can't measure what it is or where it comes from. That's an amazing truth. Now, truth is something that has to be accepted, so you have to accept what I just told you. You really can't feel the wind. You just feel what the wind does. Where it comes from, when it's going to blow, when it's going to stop, how hard it's going to blow, you have no control over that. You can't, you, there's nothing. You cannot do anything with that. Now, it's unbridled. Now, in that regard, that's the Holy Spirit of God. It goes and it does what it does and we don't have any control over my spiritual rebirth. Jesus says you must be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit of God will come into your life and enlighten you. I'm telling you, I read the Bible before I was a Christian, and I put it down. I said, this is nonsense. Some old ancient stuff. I just can't make heads or tails of it. <laughs> Somebody told me, I said, you get for reading someone else's mail. <laughs> that's God's word. That's his letter to his 
sons and daughters and you're not a child of God, so you have no business reading it. I'm like, what? But you know, what's funny is once I got saved, the Spirit of God knocked the scales from my eyes and I read it. It makes total sense to me. I hear pe- today I hear people, I can't, I can't understand it. I'm like, really? How do you not understand? It's not that hard. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some deep spiritual truths, but to, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. But it's different today because the Spirit of God is alive and well in Jose Burgos. And he testifies with my spirit that I am a child of God. Amen? And Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see it. You can't see it figuratively or literally unless you're born again. Well, how do I get born again? You don't do it. God does. When the spirit of God tugs at your heart and he invites you in, I strongly encourage you to respond to that invitation because he's not obligated to extend it a second time. Amen? So what do we see? I love this where John, or, uh, Nicodemus tells him, how is this possible? And Jesus tells him, aren't you, G- aren't you Jerusalem's teacher? Aren't you, the, aren't you a Pharisee? Aren't you a teacher of the law? How is it you not understand these things? You know how? I just explained to you how. He had not been enlightened by the Spirit of God. Jesus' question was more rhetorical. I assure you, we, we tell you what you know and have seen and you won't believe our testi- and you'll believe you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man. The Son of Man has come down from heaven, and this is a beautiful thing. This is prophetic here, verse fourteen. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness. So the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes will have eternal life. Wow, that's beautiful. Uh, You go into the Old Testament, there's a story, there's a passage where the children of Israel were not hard-headed, disobedient knuckleheads. And and sounds like us, amen? You know, there's a lot of us, a lot of us, church, similarities. The Pharisees were constantly criticized by Jesus and even John the Baptist for being hypocritical. If you're not careful, we can be Pharisees. We can have a pharisaical mindset as we go out, mindset as we go out and we judge people. You have to be careful. So you see this, Jesus says, just as, what does the pastor say? Just as the, the Son of Man was lifted up. He said, just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake. You go into the Old Testament, you see a story. Children of Israel, disobedient, church. We're not listening, not paying attention. We're walking in disobedience and defiance, and God sends a plague of snakes. Get them! God sends the snakes. Yeah, the God that wants to give you the BMW. The God who wants to bless you. He sends snakes to judge you. And the snakes are biting the children of Israel, and they're going to die from the snake bites. And God instructs Moses to hold up the bronze snake. Hold it up. And as you hold it up, those who believe, because God said, what's that called? Starts the letter F. Faith. Faith. He looks, if you look up and look at this there's snakes in the auditorium, church. They're biting you. And you're like, oh my gosh, I got to get to the emergency room. St. Margaret's and Hammond, uh, St. Catholic the community in Munster. Run, run, they're coming to get us. The snakes are killing us. You've been bitten. You got to you need an anti-venom. You're going to die. Okay, by today's standards. So you're going to run out the doors, jump in the car. You're going to call 911. You're going to do what you do. Suck the venom out. Help, I'm going to die. But I'm standing here telling you, God has said, if you keep your eye on the eagle here, just look up. To the eagle, and if you keep your eye on the eagle, you're going to live. And you guys say, you crazy, pastor. I'm out. And you jump in the car and you speed down the street, which I can understand that in today's context. But the children of Israel didn't have their hospital right around the corner. So as Moses holds up this snake, the, the instructions were to look up at the snake. Look up at the snake to be saved from the punishment of your sinful disobedience, which is why you were bit by the snake in the first place. Amen? Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up so that you may be saved. Jesus Christ is on a cross in the same manner, Old Testament picture of what's to come. As we look up at the cross of Jesus Christ, believing in faith that God has provided the sacrifice, the remedy for our sin, Amen. the anti-venom, if you will, that's going to keep us from dying and rotting in a hell that was never designed for us. Amen? Wow. 
I'm just going to skip the next verse. It's not important. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for. It's a verse we teach to our kids. It's the first verse most kids learn to recite. Jesus says, just no one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And Jesus says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only, his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into this world not to judge it, but to save it well through him. Right. It's a beautiful verse. Yes. Beautiful verse. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save it. So people don't want any part of it. Thanks, but no thanks. So you got a bigger problem because now you have to save yourself. And the Bible teaches you can't do that. So Jesus says, God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son. The, the word begotten is used in the original translation. It's interesting because angels are constantly referred to as the sons of God. Okay, and other, the godly lineage, also people refer to as sons of God. But the Bible says Jesus is the only begotten, meaning one that was born of. He's the only one that was born of human origin, though he always existed. We study in his life, and you, you, many of you thought we are going to start in Bethlehem at his birth, but we started in his pre-incarnate state because he's always existed. Amen? So to be born, that son of man that was born on earth was born to be the atoning death on the cross for your sins. Amen? And that's exactly what he came for. He didn't come to judge the world. There'll come a day when he's coming back, though, to abolish sin. We know this. Verse 18 says, There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I stand forgiven. Amen? But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God. One and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact that God's light came into the world. But people love the darkness more than they love light, and their actions were evil. And those who do evil hate light and refuse to go near it for the fear that their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing. And what they're doing is what God wants. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn it. He came to save it. And the Bible says, those who are not forgiven of their sin already stand Condemned. Now, I'm going to draw you a picture here. You, you go to court, and you stand all cocky and arrogant in your abilities and your lawyers, and you're standing before the judge, and you're like, and the judge is listening to your arguments, and you're intelligent, and you got money, so you're buying the best lawyers money could buy, and you're very articulate, and your, your, your lawyers are the same, and you wow the, the, the whole court scene with all your, your abilities and your resources, and at the very end, the judge slams the gavel and says, you're guilty. Now, you're going to prison and wait until you're executed, because they're going to give you the death penalty. So you're sitting in a prison cell somewhere, and guess what? Your lawyers can't help you anymore, and all your money doesn't help either. So you're sitting there and you're crying and you're begging for your life. And just before you hear, the, the, you, if you follow the news at all, you see it happens a lot where the, the person's been in prison for 20 years, 30 years, whatever, and he's begging and he's asking for forgiveness for a break because he's already been judged and condemned. All he can get now is mercy. And the only one who can give it to him is the governor. The governor can pardon him. And go, yeah, we're going to give you a break. And let them live. That's us. Before you come to know Jesus Christ, you're on death row. You're sitting in a prison cell waiting your execution date. And Jesus Christ is the governor who comes and offers you a pardon. Now, could you imagine that? You're in a prison cell, and the governor opens up the door with a little slot and says, Frank, I forgive you. I'm going to pardon you. And then you spit in his face. Because that's what some people do. They refuse to pardon. They don't want to. And you, there's nothing else you can do. You've already been condemned, the scripture says. You're sinful. You're going to die. And you're going to spend your eternity away from God Almighty. And he's offering you forgiveness. All you have to do is accept it. And there's some people who just won't. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died. That's why the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He's the only one who could do it. 
Now, we want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ for that reason and that reason alone. We teach the little kids, Jesus lo I love Jesus because he first loved me. That's the thing we teach the kids to say all the time. You know, that is so true. That's why I love the Lord. My life verse is Romans 5.8. That God proved his love to Jose. That when Jose was still a sinner and a fool and wanted nothing to do with the things of God, that's when Christ died for me. And I come to him, not because I was good, not because I, I, I deserved it, but because he loved me. And he did that for me. I could refuse it or I can accept it. It's that simple. That is why he came. We sang that song. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be our conquering king and friend. He came to rise so we can be reconciled. He came to, uh, he came to rise to show his power and might. Okay, this is true. Jesus came, he came for a reason. He came to die for you. And if you don't accept that, the Bible says you are already condemned where you stand. There's only one way out. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to God the Father except through me. Now, I don't mean to be offensive, but if I step on your toes, I apologize. But he's the only way. There's many people of influence, somebody like Oprah Winfrey, who seems to be a nice person, and I don't know her personally, who professes there's one God and there's many avenues to him. Well, I submit to you, if there was other avenues, Jesus would have closed down his. He wouldn't have submitted himself to be spit on, to be crucified, to be mocked, to be tormented, to be killed. If there was four other avenues to get there, I wouldn't. I'd say, why don't you take that way? Why don't you take route number two? Why don't you take route number three? And you can pick any route you want, but you're not walking over my back. There's only one way. One. We sing that song, one way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, one way, one way, and it's not popular today. So you're going to be like Nicodemus who sneak around in the dark and tell people that you follow the one way. <laughs> or you're going to proclaim it for the mountaintops. Nicodemus, you see a progression in his life. As later on in the Gospels, you see where he was actually bold enough to go to the governor and say, hey, can I have his body? I want to give him a proper burial. That wasn't the guy sneaking around in the shadows. Some chapters back, when I was a, a baby Christian, I used to carry a marble in my pocket to remind myself that God is my rock, God is my hiding place, God is my salvation. There's no reason to be afraid. The Bible says if God is with us, who can be against us? He's my God. He's mine. He's personal. This, this teaching that Nicodemus was receiving was revolutionary. For him, the kingdom of God was something that was ethnic. It was national. The Jews were going to get it. It wasn't something that was personal. So what he's hearing is very difficult for him to hear. He's very intelligent. He's very educated. Yet he stays with an open mind and receives the things of God. Now I'm standing here today preaching to you. And there's some of you here who probably have a higher level of education than I do. Okay, probably more intelligent on an IQ scale. But the fact of the matter is we need to open ourselves up to the things of God. And God will speak to you and he will educate you and he'll, you'll learn. Nicodemus wasn't above that. He wasn't beyond that. He was willing to learn. And he grows from this creeping in the shadows guy to sticking up for Jesus in a public meeting in his sphere of influence and then later standing before the governor and asking for the body. Are you growing in your faith? Are you growing in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you much bolder today than you was yesterday? We see that in the life of Nicodemus. And sometimes we need reminders. I carried a marble in my pocket. When I was a, a baby Christian, and I was at work one day, and we, you know, we wear those tight pants. <laughs> they look like the a mailman's pants, you know, they were kind of snug. And it's in my pocket, and somebody asked me, what is that? Because they could see the ball sticking out. And I said, it's a marble. And they said, for what? What's it for? And I said, I found it. Found it, taking it home to my daughter. Because I was afraid and ashamed to admit why it was in my pocket. And um, I don't do that today, but I did it then. So I've grown significantly. I was in my office preparing... Uh, actually looking over my sermon for the last time before I came in this morning, and I seen this little rock on my desk. This was given to me by one of our children here. She gave me the rock. I said, Pastor, I want you to have this. And I smiled because I instantly thought of the, the, the marble I used to carry that I no longer carry. So I left it on my desk, and I, I, inst I took it and put it in my pocket so I wouldn't forget to bring it up. Sometimes we need reminders, but we need to be bold and courageous. If Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, then we should not be ashamed of that. Amen. Actually, I wrote on my, as I was growing in my faith, I had a special bathroom in my house that was mine. <laughs> Remember that? Mine. It was a toilet and a sink. That's where I went. 
shave, get ready for work. Girls, off limits. <laughs> they could use it, but they had to hurry up and get out. That was the rules. And in that bathroom, when I get ready for work, I wrote in black marker on the actual mirror, Lord of all. To remind myself that Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of all. And a wise man once told me he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Right. So what are we afraid of? Amen? Yeah. Nicodemus was afraid, but he grew. There's a person in this church right now. I won't tell you who the person is. I'm not even going to give you the initials because usually I blurt out the name. <laughs> told me they were, they were baby Christian and they were very worried about being baptized in the presence of everybody because it's just embarrassing. Um, about my hair, you know, what it look like? Come up, splashing water on my nose, you know, worried about that. And that's a common fear. People want to do it in secret. Then it came a day where the light bulb came on. This person understood, knew for sure that Jesus Christ was Lord of their life. And this person told me, I want to be baptized. I said, on a Sunday morning? And they said, yes, on a Sunday morning. I said, what about your hair? The person said, I don't care about my hair. Bold enough, I'm going to share. I'll share at work. Now, just a, there was a transition. There was a time frame where we grow as Christians. Where are you at? I'm looking around the room today, and I don't want to embarrass nobody. It's not my style. But there's three guests that I met here today, and I don't know any other way to do it, but they were over here on this side, and they were invited by somebody. They were invited to the church by somebody. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? And if you don't know who those visitors are, I want to encourage you to get their names. I got their names right here. I remembered. I made an effort. There's two people that were invited. Not, and, and I want to encourage you to be bold and be faithful and share your faith. Don't be afraid. Put a rock in your pocket if that's what it takes. Remind you that God is God. We had about 30, we averaged about 30 kids in this VBS. I talked to Tina on the way in. We averaged about 30 last year, too. It's about 30. You know what that tells me? I, you know, this isn't popular, but this is what it tells me, that the parade, we made a gallon effort both times. Last year, we didn't do the parade. This year, we did. This year, we handed out flyers and used a, a television giveaway to get people here, and it's still a net about the same number of kids, 30-ish. Tells me the parade didn't help. But you know what does? The personal invitation. Always has, always will. Brother John asked me, he says, hey, Pastor, he says, uh, the, the phone book people called us. They want to know if we want to run our name in there again, because the last time we put a little half a page in there. And, and, and what do you think? I said, I think it's a waste of money. <laughs> We've done that. And I ask people all the time when they come through that door, how'd you hear about us? I asked the visitors today, how'd you hear about us? And they go, so-and-so, so-and-so. And one person that I can recall in the last four years told me they'd seen the sign, maybe two. One person was walking by, the days were open, the doors were open, they were going to get a pop from the vending machine, they heard the music just dropped in. One person came uh, because they'd seen us on the website, or two people maybe, three people at the most. But 95%, if not higher, of the people who walked through those doors came from a personal invitation, word of mouth, from another person. And we're so afraid. We won't, we're like Nicodemus. Don't be a Nicodemus. Actually, if you want to be one, be one. But he grew. Okay, if you're creeping in the shadows, not long to be bold and courageous, but you're willing to open your mouth later. Don't stay in the shadows. Amen? So what we see here, we have an important message to proclaim. John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus came into the world to save it, not to judge it. And those who reject that free gift that he's given are stand in condemnation already. So if they don't do anything else for the rest of their life, they said get all they can and can all they get and sit on the can. When the end of the line comes, they will stand in an eternity that was never created for them. And they will burn in a literal hell because you didn't feel it was important to open your mouth and share. And me. Here's your message, folks. Don't be a Nicodemus. And if you do want to be one, be one all the way through. Not the guy we see here, but the one we see later. Be that one. There's a process, but if you've been a Christian for any length of time and you have not grown, 
That's on you. That's on you. Spiritual birth is not your, you can't do anything about that. The spirit does that. But your growth process, that comes through regeneration. That comes through being empowered by the spirit of God that you already have. If you have the spirit of God and you're neglecting to come to Sunday school and you're neglecting to go to home groups and you're neglecting to read your Bible and you're neglecting to pray and so on and so forth, well, you know what? I can lead you to the water, folks, but I can't make you drink it. Amen? There comes a time we have to take spiritual responsibility for yourself and somebody else. Amen? Let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. Lord, I give you praise and glory, Lord, this morning. I give you honor, Father, for you're worthy of it. I praise you and thank you for this time you've allowed us to gather into your house this morning, Lord. I thank you for Nicodemus, Lord. I thank you for his example. At first, Lord, his negative example of his fear. And Father, then we see later on his example as he continues to grow. I thank you for that. Father, many of us are stuck in the shadows. We don't want to come out. And I pray for your mercy in our life, your grace, that you'd continue to grow us and stretch us, Lord, and give us the opportunities, Lord, to be faithful, Lord, to, to, to serve you, Lord, to share what we know about you, Lord. And many of us believe that we're not elegant enough, Lord, or eloquent in speech enough to, uh, to share you, Lord. We've seen that excuse with Moses as well, yet you've used him, Lord. Father, you will meet all of our needs. You'll give us what we need to do what you've called us to do. I just pray that you'd give us a fire in our hearts to do what you've asked us to do. So, Father, we praise you and thank you for this time. I pray, oh God, that your spirit would be free to move at this time, Lord, as we sing our song of invitation. My prayer is that if there's anyone here, Lord, who desires to grow in their faith, Lord, not to stay in the shadows, but to learn to be bold and to speak up for you, Lord, and to share that their love for you, Lord, unashamedly, I pray that you would help them to do that today. The first step, Lord, is a commitment to you, Lord, giving their heart and their life to you and asking you for forgiveness. Father, I pray that you would do that, that you'd move in their hearts at this time. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>